I sorta did it, kids. I think last night I sorta completed live show bingo for the year 2022. And it comes at the end of what I'm gonna call a weekend of not exactly profound insight, but compelling questions and notions. And I'll tell you all about it on the other side. Hello, you're listening to the John Huff Podcast. Oh, yeah. So as you know, a few weeks ago, I went to Italy, spent 10 days in the sun. You can hear all about that. Mostly the sun rained a little bit in Florence. Spent 10 days in Italy at the end of September. Go back a couple episodes. If you haven't already, you can hear about my adventures and misadventures along the way. (laughs) What's interesting is that when my wife and I began discussing notions of going to Europe for a little vacay, Italy was not the first considered destination, all right? Here's what happened. We were thinking about going to Europe. We were trying to think of where we would go and to what purpose. I mean, Europe's great. I've spent all kinds of time in Germany, Netherlands, poked into Austria, Czech Republic for a day on the road. And we've been to France, and we've been to England, and we've been around. And Italy's on the bucket list, man. Italy is on the radar. But initially, that was not in the crosshairs, because what we were doing was we needed a reason to go to Europe. And we thought, well, maybe we'll catch an Arsenal match in England. That could be a focal point, maybe. Try to look at the scheduling, see if that could work. But I started to look at what band could I see where that would make this a compelling reason to go. And lo and behold, wouldn't you know it, King's X was scheduled to tour Europe in the fall. And I thought, this is it, man. And I mentioned this before, because King's X would have been the final piece, the big piece, the crown jewel in live show bingo for the year. Because check it out. I've seen Sarah Harmer twice this year. Absolutely transcendent. I saw the War on Drugs live for the first time in August. That was, as I've mentioned, maybe the greatest live show I've ever seen. I saw Ghost in September, all right? And I got tickets for Steel Panther next month. So if you're running my personal table, Sarah Harmer, The War on Drugs, Ghost, Steel Panther, who's missing? the almighty King's X. And I thought, this is it. They're touring in Europe. Let's go to Europe and see a King's X gig. And so we started to build our vacation plans around where could we see King's X. And then as we're starting to narrow in, there was a gig in Cologne, Germany, which is kind of where I was leaning towards. I've been to Cologne. They have a magnificent Gothic cathedral there. One of the great cathedrals in all of the world, to be honest. I think Cologne is on like a list. (laughs) Like there's a list of the top cathedrals to go and see. You got St. Peter's, which I recently visited. And there's whatever. Cologne is one of the big ones. And I got to go there. I got to go there with Sarah and with Kay last uh, in the fall of 2021. We were on the road. We had a day off. We were within sight of Cologne. Our good friend Clemens took us there so we could see this cathedral. It was extraordinary. And I thought, let's go back. You know, let's take the little lady, go to Cologne, see a King's X gig, and then branch out for 10 days or two weeks around some spots in Europe. That's a vacation, man. That's a trip, right? And so we're getting ready to do that, getting ready to push go on tickets for King's X in Cologne. And then it's announced that the whole King's X European tour is off. It's off because primarily there were some health issues for Ty Tabor, and so they couldn't go. Needed him to be closer to home to handle some of that stuff, so the tour was off, and so the plan there collapsed. 
And we adjusted and said, well, Italy's on the radar. Italy's on the list. Let's go there. So we went to Rome, and you can hear all about that. But I thought, that's it. I'm going to fall one X short. <laughs> that's a pun, kids. I'm falling one King's X short on my bingo card for the dream board. Seeing all of my favorites that are still active in one calendar year. But, you know, sometimes life serves it up for you anyways. And I got wind yesterday that King's X, who were playing in Nashville last night, were live streaming that show for the low, low price of 24 American dollars, which is like 700 Canadian these days. Just do it, you know? Grab the ticket, catch the live stream, which I was able to put on my smart TV. So I got like 60 inches of King's X playing in Nashville last night. Wonderful! Got it on my stereo surround system. Not quite like being at the gig, but the closest I'm going to get, most likely, to King's X Live this year. So I watched that show. It was really great. It's just really great almost 40 years later since I became, since they became my favorite band to see them still performing. The original three members playing the tunes. And it warms your cockles, man. Warms your cockles to see that a person like Doug Pinnock, 72 years old, can still be up there crushing it, man. Holding that 12 string bass, <laughs> which has got to weigh a ton. Rocking it. Ty is amazing. Jerry is great. And the band sounds terrific. And it was just great to watch. And it's as close as I'm going to get probably to a live show unless I go to the States, which is not looking like it's going to happen for me this year. And so it's like a faint X on my bingo card. Maybe X with an asterisk. I don't know. But the show was great. And they played a bunch of new stuff. A bunch of stuff from the new record, Three Sides of One, which I talked about on a few episodes back. And they've been running kind of the same set list for years because they're reaching an age where the vocals just they're just not high as they used to be. So they can't sing a lot of the stuff. They drop tune stuff even further now. Still sounds great. It just gets heavier the lower you go, man. And so it was cool to see them drop in six, seven, eight songs from the new record and play them live. It's a fresh energy to the show. Place was sold out. This great club in Nashville. The sound on the live stream was terrific. They're getting really good at this. <laughs> you know, COVID. Necessity is the mother of invention, kids, and they're getting really, really good at presenting live shows via internet, and the sound was terrific. They had three or four different cameras going, so there was this element of watching a production, you know? There was some glitchy stuff, though, a little bit. There was some lag. It kept buffering, which is annoying. You know, you come to a critical moment in a song you've been waiting for all night, and then eh, it just freezes, buffers, crashes out, reloads. It's frustrating! First world problems, all right? It's the best you can do right now. Watch the live stream. It was really great, and I think it kind of completes the live show bingo card. Now, this is assuming Steel Panther is actually going to perform in November, Presumably they will, but stuff happens. You know, I'm hearing regularly of bands not being able to get across the border in time for their show. And I don't know what's holding it up. I don't know if it's a vaccination thing. I don't think it is at this point. I don't think that's really a consideration anymore. So I don't know what the border delays are for some of these bands. And it's possible that Steel Panther will get caught at the border and not make the show. And if that happens, I guess I got to throw out my bingo card. But for now, it's looking good, kids. It's looking good to have seen live in one calendar year, I think, the, my five favorite acts maybe right now that are still out there playing on the road, you know? So exciting. And I'm going to talk a little bit later on about the new Archers of Loaf record, and they are playing in Toronto in February. So I don't know, maybe next year we start a new card. And we get the loaf on it, man, because they have not toured a lot in the last 20 years. <laughs> They're about to. So, you know, there's another new card we can start maybe in the new year. But, we you know, we'll perhaps talk about that a little bit later. I got to be quick today. I have not prepared a whole lot 
by the standards of some of the other episodes. It's been like the last week, last weekend I did a bunch of pruning. It's not even pruning. Like my buddy Colin and I took down some cedars. <laughs> like I, my whole property is just trees. Looks really pretty, makes an enormous mess. And so it is with cedar trees. We could, took them down and I've been kind of cleaning up the mess all week when it's not raining. And that requires me to not be doing podcast research, to, but to be outside in nature, in the open air, cutting up stuff. So I haven't had a whole lot of time to put into this episode. I apologize for that. Some people like these hodgepodgey kind of ones. Some people really like the off-the-cuff ones. They feel, I don't know what, more natural, something like that. Other people like the more prepared ones. I can only do the best I can do, kids. I am an indie podcaster trying my best. But you know, I had some insights last week, specifically on the weekend. I've been going through this period of time where I'm still trying to figure it out. You know, the music business, the music scene is coming back, but it's rough. And music has always been rough at the indie level. It's difficult to do it. It's difficult to make a living. I've been struggling a bit with trying to find my way there. And, you know, what am I doing in my life? That's a big question. It's always on my mind. And over the past couple of weeks, you know, it's been more profound. It's been more poignant. It's been a little sharper. Poking at me just a little bit, you know. Anyways, Saturday night, barn on the farm with fresh breath. Our old pal Ken the Zen and me down to Essex County to play with Josh and Katie and Brett. Really, really enjoy those people. Really, really enjoy that music. Really, really enjoy those shows. But something interesting happened along the way. A couple things, all right? A couple things that are relevant, worth talking about. Now, I'm getting the kit ready. The YC Drum Company Beauties. Getting the kit ready for the show. That means tuning a little bit. Making sure all the gear's in order. And I'm not a great tuner of drums, okay? Tuning drums, it's like... You can be like a whisperer. <laughs> you know, Jordan Goche of YC Drum Company is a drum whisperer. That dude can pick up a drum and make it sing. I ain't one of those, all right? Tuning is an art. Tuning is a science. It requires the kind of patience that I don't really have. And so I'm trying to tune up the kit, and I'm really struggling with my 12-inch rack tom. If you're not a musician, don't get hung up on some of these details. Just kind of think about the broader issue that I'm going to get to, all right? Trying to tune up the rack, Tom, and it is not coming in for me. And what happens is I very quickly get flustered and frustrated with this, okay? It takes a bit of patience. There's a lot of science happening. There's a lot of math. There can be, you know, tuning should be a feel thing. And at this point in my career, I should be better at it than I am. But it's not working. I can't get it to sound like I want it to sound. It's making me frustrated, making me bothered. I'm trying this. I'm trying that. Suddenly, I'm in an, like an hour deep, an hour deep trying to tune a drum that should take about a mm, minute and a half. <laughs> but what's happening is that I'm not even tuning anymore. I'm just freaking myself out, just getting more and more frustrated. And the stupid thing is that I'm tuning this in my basement, in my rehearsal space, and I know as well as you do. I'm going to take it out and I'm going to drive for two hours and I'm going to be in an open air space and it's going to be utterly different anyways. You know, the room that you're in profoundly affects the way a drum sounds. It's about frequencies. It's about walls. It's about air. And I know this as I'm getting more and more frustrated, more and more flustered, more and more questioning. I know that I'm utterly wasting my time because as soon as I get to the venue, all of the dynamics in the air change anyhow. The way that drum sounds is going to change. It's all going to have to be done again. It can sound brilliant in your basement, and then you get it into a different room, and it sounds utterly different, or vice versa. So I'm sitting there knowing that it's okay where I have it, and it might sound beautiful when I get it into that other space, when I mix it with the other instruments. That's the other thing. You hear all these overtones. You hear all this weird stuff in your drum. Then you put it in to the mix with a bass and a couple of guitars, three guitars, and it's like, nobody's going to hear that, dude. And I know this. I know this. You know, but I'm still freaking myself out. And in retrospect, I know that freaking out about this drum had very little to do with the drum. <laughs> 
freaking out about the drum had everything to do with my own insecurity about my own playing. You know, sometimes what's frustrating in your life is masked. You know, you attach it to something else. So I'm tuning this drum. It's not coming in and it's not working for me. And it's making me angry because you should be able to do this by now. You're a kind of half-assed professional. You know what I mean? At least a semi-professional. And it's fundamental to be able to tune your dang drums, man. What are you, a freaking child? This is the voice that's running through my head. And the voice has nothing to do with the drum. The drum is a symbol of my own feelings of inadequacy as a player. You can't even tune your own drums, man. Who are you kidding? And, you know, this voice rises up frequently. It's a voice I call Little John. <laughs> Little John is my human, small ego voice. It's the voice of fear. It's the voice of inadequacy, self-consciousness, jealousy, anger, judgment, all of the negative stuff in my personality that exists because it exists in all people. All of the fearful, judgmental stuff comes through in the voice of Little John. And Little John speaks hard these days because I'm struggling to find my way, kids, all right? <laughs> I'm struggling to find my way, and I'm getting older, and it's starting to weigh me down a little bit. Little John comes through hard in fearful situations, and I'm in a fearful, anxious life these days, trying to find my way, you know, feeling behind, feeling like I'm not getting anywhere, feeling like things aren't working, and this is all just a breeding ground for little John to pop up and be little John. And he was preaching hard and it was attaching to this drum. You know, you can't even tune your dang drums properly. Who do you think you are? What do you think you're doing going to pretend to be a drummer with good players, you know, playing good music, good people who deserve better than you, man. And why are you trying to have a career here? You are wasting your time. You are a joke. It just ramps up. You've probably got a little John in your own head. You know, that small voice that keeps you small and is fearful and is anxious and cuts you down as a way of protecting you, as a way of protecting you from confronting what you might fear, which is being inadequate or whatever. You know, there's a lot of psychology happening here that I'm not qualified to articulate, but you can't deny when you feel these things, you know, these things are markers. I've talked about this before, and it ties again to the Italy episode and the whole selfie thing and talking about how what we are annoyed by in other people is an indication of something, some weakness in our own game, right? And it pops up again for me trying to tune this Tom and the voice coming into my head that says, dude, you are a joke. You are inadequate. And you can't even tune your own drums. And what are you doing? Stop wasting your time. Stop wasting other people's time. You know, some of us live with a remarkable oppressor <laughs> in our own heads. For me, the voice is Lil John. Big John is the higher spiritual, ancient part of me who is grounded and wise. And that exists in everyone, too. It's just a lot easier to listen to that ego voice because it's persistent and it's practiced. <laughs> ever since we're kids, ever since we learn to identify ourselves as being in some way different from everybody else, in some way distinct, siloed. Once you recognized your own name, that became an identity that's different from everybody else. That became an I, you know? And that's the ego voice, and it becomes very, very strong. And we live in a culture that encourages ego voice. And ego voice loves a story. Ego voice loves drama. Ego voice feels separate and compares itself to other ego voices. And depending on your temperament and your nurture, that can be an unfavorable comparison. That's been the curse of my life in some ways, is to feel inferior and inadequate to other people. And that pops up. Even as a 49-year-old man, that continues to pop up. Ego voice is practiced because we don't get taught to listen to the higher voice. We are not, at least in North America, a culture that works that way. We work from ego voice. We work from separateness. So it's very practiced. That's all. It's simply a muscle 
that gets practiced and you default to it. Sometimes your ego voice is a little too confident, you know? Other times, with people like me, it's perhaps not confident enough and it loves a story. Ego voice loves to feel bad. Ego voice loves to feel wounded and martyred and to attach a story, you know, and to feel hard done by and victimized and this sort of thing. And I've done a great job of practicing that voice. It's a well-honed muscle. Trying to hone Big John voice, but sometimes ego voice comes in hard and it's in particular rises up in scenarios like this where I'm just not feeling great about my playing, not feeling great about my prospects, not feeling great about the simple act of tuning a freaking drum. And it was swirling around me. And I'm wise enough to know this is going to mess up my show if I don't get a grip on it, man. And I'm also wise enough to know what's happening. But in the moment, that ego voice is incredibly strong. Little John is incredibly strong. And I wasted an hour fussing about with this drum, knowing full well it wasn't going to matter in the end anyways, you know? That happens sometimes. It's a fear response. It's an anxiety response. And it happens. It happens to me still. Perhaps it happens to you. But you can, in some ways, mitigate that just by naming that voice. I name mine Little John. And sometimes you can just be like, dude, Little John, chill, man. <laughs> Let Big John handle this, okay? You are much bigger than your ego. This little tiny slice of identity you have is not your whole world. In fact, most of your world is the bigger, expanded, universal world. You are space dust, kids. <laughs> we are all stardust that fell on this planet, all right? We are part of something much, much, much bigger than your little ego voice would have you believe, you know? The stakes and the drama are not nearly as intense as your ego would have you believe. But that wasn't even the initial lesson. <laughs> I wasn't even going to talk about that. It's just occurring to me as I'm talking, or it's being gifted to me by the ether, by Big John, as I'm talking about this. You know, it was utterly an ego response, a fear of my own inadequacy as a player, and a fear of being found out to be a not good enough player. Because I'm self-conscious about that, and I struggle with my confidence in my own playing ability. But it ties into what I wanted to talk about, which is just simplicity. For a long time, on many tours, I have been really drawn to and practiced this simplistic approach in my playing, because I think what I do best is play simply. That's what I love about Charlie Hall from The War on Drugs, et cetera, et cetera. I love the simplicity approach. You know, the sheer comfort of playing the groove laying back, letting the other instruments take the lead, and just being solid, you know? I'm really drawn to that as a player and as a, even as I practice. I'm not super interested in practicing all the fancy stuff. It doesn't super duper appeal to me. Playing simply does, and having a simple setup does. And that's where this really comes in, because I'm fighting with this rack tom, and I'm like, my favorite setup doesn't even have a rack tom in it. <laughs> Well, I've been on the road with Carly Thomas, been on the road with Sarah Smith. I have played a three-piece drum kit. Floor tom, kick drum, snare. That's it. And there is so much weight lifted. Literally. The reason you do that is simply to save room in the van, save room in the car, you know? There's not a lot of space for all the gear. So if you can leave stuff behind... It makes just a little extra room, literally less weight. So I stopped using a rack tom when I was on the road with Carly because we didn't have room in the car that we rented. So, all right, I'll play a three-piece. And I loved it. I love the simplicity. There is an existential, a conscious weight, not just a literal practical weight, but a conscious weight that lifts for me with that setup. And I just love the simplicity of it. And so when I went to Europe with Sarah for the first time, I started, I had a four-piece setup going. I began to pull the drum out of that. I began to pull the rack tom out of that and just play the three-piece. And that became the kit that I play. And I loved it. I loved it so much. Just the weight that I felt lifted. I love the setup. I think it looks cool. 
I think it plays cool and it feels good to me. And it lends itself to this simplicity that I love in playing, in drumming. Having a simple setup inspires me to keep playing simply, which just feels good to me. You have to pay attention to what you feel. <laughs> it feels really good to sit in front of a setup like that. I really, really like it, but I haven't been doing it. You know, I adopted that as my setup for a little while, and I felt this pressure inside. Again, and just inflicted upon myself. It's like, it's not really what people do, man. People don't really play three-piece setups. And by the way, you purchased a 10 and a 12-inch Tom for your custom kit at considerable expense. You should probably use them, you know? That's not a good reason to add something to your setup because you feel guilty because you purchased it. <laughs> you know, but that's the insecurity that runs through me. That is the insecurity that runs through me. You cannot be an individual acting from a place of insecurity. And I've had messages, I've had nudges from the universe. I know I'm getting esoteric here. I know I'm getting weird. And if this isn't your bag, try to pull back from the spiritual element and just think of it in practical life terms, all right? But I've been getting nudges lately, hard ones, directly about simplicity and simplifying. I've had a couple of distinct nudges, synchronicities, in which the word simplify was used, all right? It has been a message to me, perhaps from Big John, perhaps from something even bigger than that, to say, simplify. I've had that come up, and it's on my mind a lot, because life is complex, and we build, in a lot of cases, complexity into life for whatever reason. You know, the great Philip McKernan, motivational speaker, life coach with whom I have spoken, has this idea that we make complex lives on purpose to avoid our real purpose, to avoid having to look at what's not working, to distract ourselves from bad feelings, difficult feelings like the ones I've been feeling. You know, it's very difficult to feel anxious and worried and like you're not getting anywhere and sad about that and frustrated if you're just wall to wall scheduled. If you're just busy, 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 busy all the time, you can avoid your feelings. It's kind of like a drug, you know? I don't want to do that. It's important to confront your feelings and understand what they are. That goes back to the selfie stuff. It's important to confront your feelings and understand what they mean. And this notion of simplicity so much appeals to me as a player, but I've been feeling self-conscious about that because it's not really the way it goes. And it's funny because I've had so many compliments over the years on playing a three-piece setup. You know, people are in a weird way impressed by that or intrigued by that. And you know, maybe that's my individual signature. I just have felt like it's not okay. And that's stupid because whatever you do that's good, that works, that feels good to you is okay. As long as it doesn't hurt anybody, all right? You know what I'm saying here. And I had to confront that again. And I think that's what the Rack Tom thing was all about. It was partly about insecurity and how my own insecurity reveals itself in frustration at something different from the problem, you know, something to latch on to. But I also think it was a message about sheer simplicity. Like, dude, you love playing the three-piece setup. Now, there are a couple of Fresh Breath songs where that rack tom is a voice that matters, and I have to consider that. I have to think about what to do with that. But I love the three-piece setup. I love how it looks, and I get cool reactions from people about it. I love the way it feels more than anything. It feels so comfortable and so light to me. I love that feeling, and that feeling comes into your playing. You know, your feelings come into everything that you do. <laughs> As a player, I love that feeling of simplicity. I love that look of simplicity. And it's easier to carry, you know what I mean? But I'm thinking to myself, well, it's not okay. Little John says, that's not okay. People don't do that. They do. But, you know, for me, it's like, oh, you can't do that. That's not the way it works. BS, man. I'm calling letters on that. It was a reminder to me. Dude, if you were playing the setup you actually wanted to play, you wouldn't be fighting with this rack tom for an hour. It wouldn't even be part of the plan. <laughs> 
That makes me feel bad for the rack, Tom, but that's another issue I gotta work through, all right? It's like it was a reminder. You value simplicity in your setup. Why are you fighting with this thing? You know, it was a reminder to me. Sometimes that's a synchronicity. Sometimes that's a clue, man. When you fight with something like that, when you resist, when you push against something like that that's not working and it's frustrating, step back and say, what is this telling me? Well, maybe it was telling me, leave it at home. Leave it at home, dog. Play the setup you want to play. I didn't. I took the drum with me and I had it dialed in a little bit. Another drummer on the show plays with Area 51, who's very good at tuning, was able to tweak it into a better place, which is great. You can learn a lot from that. If you're humble enough to do so, you know, a lot of drummers, a lot of people would just walk in and not allow themselves to be instructed by somebody. I have learned to not be that. You know, you can learn a lot from other people and drummers who are good at tuning have a lot to teach you. And so I listened to some advice on that. We got the drum dialed in a little bit better. That's cool. And again, in the mix, it sounded fabulous because a lot of the stuff that was bothering me, you can't hear when it's mixed in with other instruments. You know, you lose sight of that. But when you're anxious and ramped up and little John is in control, you don't listen. You don't listen to yourself, man. But I've taken that message very, very seriously, the simplicity message. And I'm thinking to myself, I may, again, dedicate myself to that three-piece setup as a signature because I like it and it feels good. And it's something that I need to revisit. And I intend to do that beginning as soon as I'm done recording this podcast. But the question becomes, how can simplicity be applied to the rest of your life? And this is one for everybody. To what extent is your life way more complicated than it needs to be? And is it made that complicated because you're avoiding something? That's a question only you can answer, but it's one worth thinking about, all right? Now, I'm looking around my room. I've made a point of cleaning my little studio once a week because it gets covered in dust and cat fur, and I'm looking around. I'm trying to thin things out, but your physical space is a clue. It's that hermetic wisdom. <laughs> As above, so below. As within, as without. Your outer world is a reflection of your inner world. And so if you're looking around and your apartment or your house or your garage or your yard is just wall-to-wall -wall junk and stuff that you don't need and don't use, that has an existential weight. You know, simplicity in the way your rooms are set up makes a difference. It tells you a lot. If you've got a lot of clutter everywhere, do you have a lot of clutter inside? And what is that clutter doing? What is it masking? What is it helping you avoid? You know, so I've tried to clean this space because a clean space just feels better. A clean car just feels better. You know, I used to have a saying in my head, a clean car runs better. It doesn't, but it feels better. And that feeling is important. So how can you simplify the space around you? This is me asking me. How can you simplify the space around you so it feels lighter, so it feels better? And what clarity can that give you on your life? This is questions for me. This is Big John talking here, you know? How can I simplify my drum setup and own that? And how does that feel? How can I clean up my space and get rid of stuff that is just taking up room and adding existential weight to my perception? And what is that weight doing? It is pulling you down. That is what weight does. You know, you need to get stuff out of your way. And so I'm cleaning up the trees around my yard. I've been spending a lot of time outside because we cut down all these cedar trees, which created a massive mess in my backyard. I don't like that. That is existential weight, too. So I've been setting myself to cleaning that up. You know, action is important. <laughs> action is a great antidote to depression and anxiety, which I've talked about before. It's one of the reasons I haven't been able to prep this episode very well. I've been outside while the weather has been freaking glorious, taking care of that, getting that weight off my mind and getting that stuff cleared out of my yard. How can you simplify your schedule? What are you doing with your time that is a waste of that time or is compulsive like social media scrolling, which I still struggle with? That's what these apps are designed to do, give you relentless dopamine, addict you. And then that becomes a clutter again 
a, an existential clutter, a time clutter. <laughs> How much time are you spending on that that's wasted time? What activities are you doing that you don't even want to do and don't serve you and are taking your time? You know, are you writing the songs these days? Are you writing your poems? Are you doing your art? Are you taking that course you want to take that will help you in your career? Are you doing them? Or are you filling your time with empty stuff like social media scrolling and TV and Netflix or whatever that's just cluttering up your life? Are you doing too many things? Are you going too many places? Are you obligated to too many things? There is a simplicity in living that feels better. You know, if you're dealing with a lot of anxiety, if you're dealing with a lot of depression, take a look at whether your life can be simplified and take the steps to do it and see how that feels and see what opens up when you just take that existential weight off yourself. Take it out of your rooms. Take it out of your schedule. Take it out of your thoughts. That's another place where I need to simplify intensely because I'm churning all the freaking time. And it's one of the reasons I'm in therapy <laughs> to help me work through these thoughts and release them. You know, I was going to go into a whole other kind of personal development section here that comes from my conversations with Ken the Zen over a weekend. I'm not going to have time to do that, but perhaps on, the, on a subsequent episode, I'll get into some of this other stuff. But right now, it's notions of simplicity. And that's what I'm presenting to you today. That is what is being presented through me <laughs> to you from Big John and his friends in the higher echelon. <laughs> simplicity. I've been hit over the head repeatedly with this notion of simplifying life, simplifying thinking, simplifying my setup, simplifying my playing, embracing that simplicity again of being okay with it. You know, you feel this pressure as a drummer to be busier than you are. And when I screw up on shows or when I try to execute things that don't come off that well, almost 100% of the time, it's me feeling like I'm not being busy enough, feeling like I have to do something noticeable and impressive. I still, after years of playing and touring and performing, feel that pressure. And that is an insecurity, man. That is an insecurity. And then I try to do that and I screw it up because I'm pigeonholing. I'm, I'm forcing in stuff that doesn't belong. And it's not my vibe. That's not how I play. Simplicity is how I play and how I play best. And I need to own that. You need to own what you do that feels good to you. Because what feels good to you is what's meant for you. You know, that's another thing. You can think about if you're in a band, does it feel good to you? Does the music feel good to you? Does the hang feel good to you? If it doesn't, and there doesn't seem to be an obvious way to fix that, maybe it's just not meant for you. Maybe some other band, some other music is meant for you. You have to own these things. You have to own what feels good to you. Beginning to ramble. All of that just to say, think about simplicity. Think about where your life is too busy where it's stressful, where it causes anxiety, and think about how you can simplify those things and embrace the simplicity. You know, the culture, the marketing is all about the hustle, you know, the hustle and being busy and accomplishing all these things. And the hustle is marketing, dude. Never trust the marketing. The marketing would have you believe that you can take a white t-shirt and you can splatter mustard all over it and ketchup and then run it through the grass and put it into the washing machine and it will come out on the other side pristine white. You know that's BS, Holmes. I know that's BS. How do they get away with those commercials? It's a complete lie. The marketing is a lie. Don't believe the lie of the hustle. Own what feels good to you. What feels good to you is meant for you. For me, simplicity in playing, simplicity in setup feels good to me. And I have to extend that into the rest of my life to start feeling better, to start getting more connection to the big part of you. And the big part of you is what will lead you to the real fulfillment, man, if you're willing to look at it. All I'm saying, real quick, the brand new Arches of Loaf record was released last week in a week of new records, man. New Arctic Monkeys, New Striper came out, 
Archers of Loaf. And I'm putting a plug in right now for Jackie Neville's new record, If You Get Lonely. This is what I want you to do, all right? Before I get to the loaf, Jackie Neville, of course, was a guest on this podcast, episode number 47. She is ex of the Balconies, one of my favorite bands of all time. You've got two homework assignments this week, kids. I want you to go listen to the Jackie episode number 47. I want you to go listen to her new record, which is fabulous, If You Get Lonely. The reason I want you to do that is because if the stars align, as I hope and think they will, Jackie's going to be back next week, all right, as a guest on the show again, talking about this record. So go listen to her episode, listen to that record, and if you have questions about it, send them to me. I will ask Jackie when we record our episode, all right? For now, the new Arches of Loaf record, Reason in Decline. The Loaf is a band that I really, really love. They came to me at an important time in my life. I was introduced to the Archers of Loaf by the poet Chris Banks, also a guest on this podcast. Go listen to his episode. He, uh, he's a poet. He's fabulous. He's a good friend of mine. We met back in the 90s, and he tipped me off to the Loaf. Now, at the time, I had been somewhat disconnected from music. I had been, as you know, a hair metal guy and a hard rock guy, and that was my jam. And then I began to branch out. And one of the things that branched me out was when Chris presented The Archers of Love to me. Now, he is a punk guy. He is an indie rock guy. You know, He listened to a spectrum of music utterly different from my spectrum of music. But we were at a party in teacher's college, and something was playing that kept catching my ear. And it was a weird song written and performed on piano, which it turns out is called Chumming the Ocean, and it's by Arches of Love. And I kept hearing it, and really, there's there's some hooks in that tune, man. And so I began to twig to this song, and Chris explained, it's the Arches of Love. I'm like, what is that? And then I began to listen, and this is not a hard rock hair metal band from the 80s, all right? This is a 90s indie rock, noise rock, college band. You know, this is indie radio, The Archers of Loaf. And they had, they developed a really, really solid cult following. This is music utterly different from anything I would have listened to before. Their first album, Icky Metal, is an indie rock masterpiece. Then VV, then All the Nations Airports, then White Trash Heroes. But I got in, started listening to this music, and it was such a breath of fresh air to me. Noise rock. I never listened to noise rock before. I never listened to indie rock before. And I began to really get into the Archers of Loaf. And then they came to town, L-Town. They played the Embassy. Remember the Embassy, which subsequently burned down under suspicious circumstances. (laughs) I went to see the Loaf at this little club in L-Town. And what a show it was. What a show it was. I had never really been exposed to that kind of music played in a room like that. And Eric Bachman, the singer, his voice just filled that room in a way that I've never heard a room filled before. It was just this massive wall of noise, this massive wall of sound. And then Eric's voice just coming through that, just lifting up the whole room. You know, it was just such a cool experience. Great show. And I became a big, big fan of the Archers of Loaf. And I was with them until the end of the decade. They released what was their last record, White Trash Heroes. And then he got off, they went, things kind of fell apart. It's like there were some day jobs. It's just like, all right, we're done here. I think uh, one of the, maybe the, one of the guitar players had to have surgery, carpal tunnel. It's like, you know what? We did it. We did the indie circuit. That's tough to do. You know, there was a, a point in time after they released Icky Metal, maybe even after they released VV, which came after it, when... I think Warner, Warner Music was coming along saying, hey, Loaf, sign, major label. And they turned it down for various reasons. Wanted to stay indie, didn't want to be connected to some of the other acts on that label. I don't know if that was a good decision or a bad decision, but they stayed underground. And it's tough. It's tough in the underground. It was tough in the 90s. It's tougher now. It's tougher for everybody now, unless you blink 182. And the Loaf released some really interesting music, utterly different from anything I listened to before. And I really like it. In fact, I fell in love with the band. I really did. You know, seeing them live was great. And then after White Trash Heroes, they broke up. 
Eric Bachman did some solo records, and then he started a project, fundamentally a solo project called Crooked Fingers, which was much different. This music was gentle, weird, a little bit spacey, a lot of acoustic guitar playing, and he sang differently. You know, he was like, there's a song on, I think it's All the Nation's Airports called Vocal Shrapnel. Well, that's what his voice was like on those early loaf records. Vocal shrapnel. I don't know how he did it. I don't know how he survived a tour yelling that way. <laughs> it's amazing live. Like it just filled that space in an incredible way. I don't know how he kept it up. But then when he started Crooked Fingers, he started singing more gently. The songs were more melodic. It was not noise rock anymore. It was independent, not quite folk, maybe a little bit folk, a different sort of thing. And off he went, and I saw Crooked Fingers live, and I've seen Eric live solo, house show, fabulous. Really liked the Crooked Fingers records. And then The Loaf popped up again pre-COVID with a couple new songs. Everybody's like, what happened? The Loaf is back. And they were going to release a record, and then COVID. The record is out now. It is Reason in Decline, and it's just really good, man. It's just really good, but it is not the same. It is not the same as Old Loaf. Somebody on the Loaf Facebook page described it as a rock Crooked Fingers record. And I think that's an apt description of it. Now, if you've never listened to Archers of Loaf and you've never listened to Crooked Fingers, that doesn't mean anything to you. <laughs> but I think it's apt. I think the songs are more melodic than particularly Icky Metal or Vivi. Those are great records. Go listen to them. And then with All the Nation's Airports and White Trash Heroes, they started to get, they, I think they tried to go a little more mainstream, still weird, but a little more melodic, a little more accessible, a little more mainstream. I've heard their first couple records described as brash. <laughs> brash is a good way to put it. Then things got a little bit more melodic. And I think this is an extension of that reason in decline. So if you're coming in looking for icky metal, if you're coming in looking for wrong or backwash or anything like that, you're not going to get that. But you are going to get flavors of all the nation's airports. You're going to get flavors of white trash heroes. There are a few songs I'm going to tip you off to really, really quick. Saturation and Light, which is just a magnificent tune. The Loaf, one of their signatures is this jangly lead guitar that'll just play a repeating pattern in kind of a dissonant way. Like I think in their first couple records, some of the guitars were out of tune on purpose. Like it creates this dissonance and the lead guitar will just play this kind of dissonant melody over top of everything the whole time. And that can be upsetting. <laughs> that can be, in terms of auditory, that can be actually a little bit upsetting if you're not ready for it. That's a signature and it comes through a lot in this record. You hear it on saturation and light, but just a really melodic song. There's a lot of melody happening on this record, which was not really a trademark of the early Arches of Love stuff. I'm going to put you on to Amy, which is a guitar ballad. Also, not something you would have heard on an early Archers of Loaf record, but it's really, really pretty. And at the end, there's actually vocal harmonies. What? Also, not something you would have heard on an early Archers of Loaf record. So there's this really pretty harmonies at the end, a really pretty song. And what's going on here is that these guys are in their 40s or 50, maybe. They were writing songs in their 20s that were angry, brash noise rock songs. They're not that anymore. They're men. They have careers and children, and they're writing from a more mature place. And so what you get is more mature lyrically. What you get is more mature musically. That's what happens, kids. And it's different from the early Arches of Low stuff, but that doesn't mean it's not good. It's really good. It's just different. And so it's melodic. You get these harmonies at the end of Amy. I wonder if they will do those harmonies live, if they'll even do that song live. I'm hoping to see them in February to find out, and I'll tell you all about it if I do. Amy's a beautiful song. In the Surface Noise is something that I think harkens back a little bit to the old days. It's kind of epic. The whole verse, everything is just driven by this repeating tom pattern. You know, toms, if you tune them right, elevate in a weird way and create this kind of tribal epic almost kind of vibe and it comes through on this song in the surface noise i've talked about that song before because it was released before the record so i tipped you off to it it's a great song really really like it 
And I think it harkens back to something from All the Nations Airport. So it's noisy and it's a bit epic, but it's melodic in a way that the new Archers of Love stuff kind of is. And I'm going to point you to the last song, War is Wide Open, which is a piano ballad. Eric likes to throw in a piano ballad. And if you go back and listen to Chumming the Ocean from All the Nations Airports, which was the first Archers of Low song that I really connected to, such a weird song, but so haunting. <laughs> Just haunting and kind of sad. But the songs were so weird and the lyrics were so weird. But go listen to Chumming the Ocean by Archers of Love. In fact, I'll put it on the John Off podcast referenced on the podcast playlist. And there's a bunch of Archers of Love stuff you should check out if you haven't. But go listen to Icky Metal. Go listen to VV. This is stuff that's not like a lot of what you've listened to. I promise you that. Really, really interesting. Really, really strange. They were a fun band to see live. And they still are, I reckon. And I like this album, and I was going to talk more about it, but I've run out of time talking about all this, you know, personal development mumbo jumbo. The Arches of Love, Reason in Decline. I think it's a cool record. I think it's most definitely worth checking out, and you should check out again Jackie Neville's new record, If You Get Lonely. In preparation for next week, I'm going to do the Patreon plug very, very quickly. There is a Patreon page for this podcast, patreon.com slash John Huff Podcast. Where, for the low, low price of $5 a month, you can just support the show, man. Help me cover my expenses, warms my cockles. It most definitely helps me out. I want to thank you so much if you have done that. You can think of it as tipping me a buck twenty-five for every episode of this show. If you're into what I'm doing, man, if you're getting something from this, if you're getting inspiration, if you're just getting new music, if you're being entertained, if it's simply a voice that helps you get through the week, please do consider just throwing me a little tip, $5 a week, Patreon, $5 a month, sorry, patreon.com slash John Huff Podcast. You can find me on social media, JW underscore Huff on Instagram, John Huff Podcast on Facebook, John Huff Podcast on TikTok. Share these episodes if they're doing something for you, man. Word of mouth is still the best marketing. Please consider leaving me a rating and review, preferably a positive one, if you're enjoying the program. Drop me a line. Let me know what you're listening to. Let me know, you know, if anything's resonating with you or if there's stuff you want me to tackle, stuff you want me to take on in these episodes. I am happy to consider that. I'm really rushing this ending because I got to take my cat to the vet. No need to worry. Standard routine annual checkup, but I missed the appointment last week (laughs) through varying circumstances and I can't be late this time. So I got to wrap and go. I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank you for supporting as you have, even if it's just a quick message to say, hey, I liked that episode, or a comment on Facebook. Warms my cockles, lets me know you're listening. Sometimes doing what I'm doing feels like you're working in a void, you know? So a comment, a little quick message really helps me. Just know you're out there. I want to tell you that good things happen when you put yourself out there. I want you to consider simplicity in your life and how you can simplify things Lift that existential weight. I'm going to shut up shutting up. I will catch up with you in a week. Until then, I'll check you later. Yeah. And that charming the ocean signal is sent, received and responded to, the water is red, 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 red.